Hello and welcome to Student of the Gun Radio. I'm your host, Paul Markle, and thanks for joining us today. Now, joining me in the studio is Jared, my production engineer. He's going to help me out all day and all season long. Now, before we get started, we want to thank Keltec Firearms of Cocoa, Florida, and we also want to thank Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Hey, Jared, are you wearing your Crossbreed right now? Jerry just gave me the thumbs up. He is indeed wearing his crossbreed, as am I. And I also have a kel pistol in my front pocket, so I'm double covered right now. Now, as we get going, uh, we will also uh, acknowledge our friends at the Firearms Radio Network. We were, we're very proud to be on the Firearms Radio Network and be a part of it, and they are our bandwidth sponsor for today. Now, as you uh, hear the melodious sounds of my voice, you obviously know if you're paying attention, if you're a gun person, that Governor Hickenbottom, Hickenlooper, uh, I, I really don't care what the governor's name is because he's not a friend of mine, but the governor of Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper, just signed the, a, 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 I saw it online, it was referred to as a landmark, three landmark gun control bills. So uh, right now uh, it bans, one, number one, it bans the capacity of the magazine that you can own legally in the uh, state of Colorado. It also requires a universal background check for every person every time they cha- exchange a gun between one person or another, not just dealers, but let's say you and I are friends and I say I'd like to buy your shotgun from you. I can no longer in the state of Colorado just give you money and you give me the shotgun. That has become a felony. That is now illegal. Also, they ta- they uh, added a tax onto gun ownership. That's right. You, as a gun owner in Colorado, if you wish to sell a gun to another person, you have to pay for the background check. That's right. Welcome to the People's Republic of Colorado. Now, I've got a lot of friends up in the state of Colorado, and I was just talking to one of them last week. And he said, Paul, the the biggest problem that we have, he goes, everyone's focused over the magazines. He said, they're, they're you know, they're really uh, annoyed and they're about the whole Magpul thing and Magpul's going to be leaving the state. And, and they're, they're upset about that. He said, but that's not really the biggest problem with this bill. He said, is the biggest problem is the actual, this new background check deal. And people say, well, the reasonable people out there are like, well, what's wrong with background checks? I, I approve of that. Every, every single person should have to go through a background check before they're allowed to own a firearm. Okay. Uh, reasonable people stick with me here. They changed the definition of a firearms transfer from a purchase and a sale where you give me money and I give you a product to transfer of possession. So I come over to your house with my Benelli shotgun. We've been hunting the night before or we're going to be hunting the next day. I leave the shotgun with you and I go somewhere else. I just transferred possession from myself to you. And if we didn't conduct a background check, We just both committed felonies. You're like, ah, come on, Paul. No, no, that's it's that bad. Uh, They grandfathered in currently existing 30 round magazines. However, the onus is upon the owner to prove or determine that he owned it before the cutoff date. You say, well, how can you do that? Exactly. Now it becomes an arbitrary enforcement of the law. Now, if you're a smart person, if you're sharp out there, you might be thinking, well, Paul, how does any of this stop crime? How do any of these new measures hinder real legitimate criminals? Well, the answer is they don't. What it does do is it creates tens of thousands of new potential criminals that weren't criminals the day before. It has criminalized gun ownership in the state of Colorado. And everyone likes to talk about gun people. We're all about the Second Amendment. Now, when people ask me about the Second Amendment, I like to say, well, you know, I'm kind of fond of that whole entire Bill of Rights, not just the one amendment. I kind of like them all. And I kind of think we should apply and enforce all of them. I think our elected officials should actually read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and do their darndest to follow them. But I guess that's a long stretch of the imagination today here in 2013. Now, getting back to the Second Amendment, yes, I understand the Second Amendment. I understand uh, the purpose of it and and the design. But let's talk about the Fourth Amendment. 
Now, what does the Fourth Amendment guarantee? The Fourth Amendment essentially guarantees that you can be secure or you should, as a citizen, be secure in your property and papers and personal effects. That is, no law enforcement agent or no government agent can just arbitrarily take your property without due course of law, without probable cause and a warrant issued by a judge. So a police officer can't just stop you, get into your car and say, I'm taking this and there's nothing you can do about it. If he does not have probable cause to do that, he cannot do that. They can't go to your house uh, or you're on the shooting range and a police officer comes up and says, hey, where did you get those 30 round magazines? Oh, I've had these for years. Can you prove it? Do you have a receipt? Well, no. Well, I'm just going to confiscate those until you prove to me that you actually own them before the cutoff date. And you say, oh, that would never happen. Really? Really, ladies and gentlemen uh, in the United States of America? Uh, this week, uh, as I'm recording this, in the state of New York, undercover police officers have set up gun purchase stings. The very first arrest and charges of the new SAFE Act. Now, when you hear the term SAFE Act, Jared, doesn't it make you feel warm and fuzzy inside? Jared's smiling because when he hears SAFE Act, he just feels safer. And that's what it's all about, right? It's all about feeling safer. Well, the uh, SAFE Act, uh, the first person has been arrested and charged with felonies under the new SAFE Act. Why is that? Well, because he owned a Bushmaster rifle and it had some Tapco furniture on it and some Tapco magazines, and after the passage of the SAFE Act, he decided he wanted to sell it. Well, an undercover police officer came to purchase it, and guess what? This gentleman has been arrested. That's right. He is now a felon. He wasn't a felon previous to this, but he is now, or he will potentially be if he's convicted. Now, you have to be convicted to be a felon, uh, but, uh, well, and you say, well, what has the New York SAFE Act done to protect the people against criminals. Cricket. Uh, nothing. But what we've done is we've created thousands upon thousands of new criminals. Uh, folks, in case you missed the first episode, I was a police officer for 17 years. I went through the police academy. I actually graduated first in my academy. Thank you very much. So I know a little bit about bad guys and good guys. And if you ask reasonable people, if you ask people who say, well, do criminals go to gun shops and fill out paperwork and buy guns? And they'll say, mm, well, they'll, you know, even anti-gun people will begrudgingly tell you, well, no. Okay, so adding more and more paperwork and more and more steps to the process of owning a gun is somehow going to keep criminals from owning them, correct? Hmm, no. Oh, okay. Well, then why are we doing this? Well, because we have to do something. Well, are we adults or are we sixth graders? We have to do something. We we have to do something. Well, why don't you go out in the street and dance naked? That That's doing something, and it'll be less uh, bothersome to me. But no, we have to do something. And even the governor of New York admitted that they may have, may have, rushed the SAFE Act through legislation behind closed doors without reading it or thinking it. Uh, today, actually, I saw on the good old internet machine that the uh, Grand Governor Cuomo, yes, I know how it's pronounced, uh, said that, uh, well, they didn't realize that you, they can't enforce the whole seven-round magazine because he just found out that most semi-automatic pistols don't come with seven round magazines that most of them come with 10 round magazines or 15 or 17 and manufacturers of Glocks and SIGs and uh, Smith and Wesson M and P's and XD's and all your favorite guns. They don't make seven round magazines for those. Even the 1911, if the 1911 that you love and own was made after 1989 or 90, not sure when they really made that change. I don't recall, but, uh, 1911's the original army version had held seven rounds. Then what did they do? About 20, 25 years ago, they redesigned the follower so they could fit one more round into that gun. So even the, uh, the century plus old 1911 pistol has an eight round magazine. So what did uh, the governor say? He said, well, you can own, I'm going to rescind that part of the law. 
You can own a 10-round magazine, but you're never allowed to put more than seven in it at a time. So what do we have now? Are we going to have random stops of police officers checking, counting out the number of rounds in a person's magazine? Hey, you, come here. I need to count the number of rounds that are in your magazine. Oh, eight rounds? You're going to jail. You're now a felon. It's lunacy, ladies and gentlemen. It's craziness. And I'm sure some of you out there probably have mothers and fathers or grandmothers or great aunts or whatever or people that you work with that think that's just reasonable. Come on. Come on, Paul. You, 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 need, to just, you need to just be reasonable. Because if we're all reasonable then evil people will cease to exist. Is that correct? That if we can just all be reasonable? Ladies and gentlemen, we've been reasonable for 70, 80. Uh, we've been reasonable in the United States since the 30s. Since 1934, we've been reasonable. Our gun owners, gun owners of America, we've been reasonable since 1934. And what has that gotten us? Well, it's gotten us to the point today where we're off the charts, lunatics. We were, things are even crazier today. If you would have told our grandfathers, well, when uh, they passed the uh, the first gun control act in '34, say, well, yeah, we can we can accept that. That's that's okay. That's not really going to affect us. We're we're good to go with that. And say, well, eventually, here's what they're going to do. And they say, you're crazy. You're a crazy person. Well, we've been reasonable for going on 80 years now. And guess what? It never gets better. We don't ever get anything back. They don't ever take something away from us and say, oh, well, we decided to go ahead and give it back for you, back to you now. Now, I do know about the sunset clause in the, the It's a Crime Bill from 1994. Yeah, I got that part. And has anyone thought about uh, where we would be today if it wouldn't have been for the crime bill in 94? Uh, we had 10 years where manufacturers were tiptoeing around the whole AR-15. The AR-15, uh, it was designed uh, back in the 60s by Gene Stoner. Thank you, Gene. And uh, I know he's up in his inter return, eternal reward right now. You don't have to remind me of that. But uh, the AR-15 is not a new design. It's a relatively old design. And uh, in 94, when they passed the crime bill, well, the manufacturers of ARs kind of, they kind of went underground or they really stopped putting uh, emphasis on the gun. And they ramped it up around 2003, 2004, when the uh, crime bill expired, when it sunsetted, and when it sunset. And uh, what did we have? Well, we had people who never, ever considered owning one went out and bought them. Right now, the AR-15 is the A number one most popular rifle in the United States of America. Not just with bad people, with real people, with you, with me, with your friends and neighbors. It's the number one most popular rifle in the United States of America. And... How is it that more people in the United States own AR-15 rifles today? And according to the FBI's crime statistics, violent crime in the United States is way, way down. And you say, oh, how can that be? We've got these mass shootings. Yes, we have incidents here and incident there. But across the nation, violent crime is down. How can that be possible if more people in America own evil, mean, nasty assault rifles, or what I like to call happy rifles? If more people own happy rifles than at any time in our history, how can it be that crime is down, that violent crime is down? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, because more good guys are armed. I'm sorry, it's not that difficult. More good guys are armed. Now, yes, we still have crazy people, but guess what? We're always going to have crazy people. And when you focus all of your legislative efforts on punishing the citizen while completely ignoring the recidivist criminal, that doesn't make things better, ladies and gentlemen. Tell me how turning tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of residents of the state of New York, the state of Colorado, turning them all into potential criminals at the stroke of a pen, how does that reduce the existing crime rate or how does that curb crime? Look yourself in the mirror. It doesn't. It doesn't. Well, what does it do? Well, why are we doing it then? Well, go back to we have to do something. We've got to do something. Well, and so we might as well just do that. Well, for those of you who like, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who like to be adults, we like the Second Amendment. 
but I like the Fourth Amendment. I like to think that if I own a piece of property, if I own property, it should be my property. If I lawfully own it, and I'm not talking about heroin. I'm talking about property. I'm talking about lawfully, legally owned and purchased property. If you have a piece of property, what doesn't matter what it is, you have an object that you have purchased that you own lawfully, you want to transfer it, you want to sell it to another person. If you have to go to a government agency, do you have to seek out the permission from a bureaucrat to transfer it from yourself to someone else? Is it still, in fact, your property? And you say, oh, of course it is. Really? How can it be yours? Because if you have to seek permission, uh, I'm assuming that most of you out there are over the age of 18. If you're below 18, thanks for joining us today. I'll watch my mouth. But uh, most of you are adults. Now, when you lived in your parents' house, you had to seek permission. You want to borrow the car? Seek permission. You want to stay out past 10 o'clock on a school night? Seek permission. You had to seek permission. Now, when you sought permission, what did we all learn when we were teenagers? There's that fine line between asking permission and asking forgiveness. Why is that? Well, because we know that sometimes it's easier to ask for forgiveness because forgiveness is just is an after the fact. If I ask permission, I could be told no. There's always that chance that I could be told no, and I would just be out of luck. So you want to transfer your property from yourself to another person, and you have to seek out the permission of a third-party government bureaucrat who doesn't know you from Adam. Ask their permission to transfer that property. Guess what? They can say no. Well, I'm a lawful citizen. I pay my taxes. I'm not a criminal. What do you mean, no? That's exactly what I mean. No. Ask your friends who've, uh, who have very common names. Or Irish names, my friend Mike Boyle. Mike Boyle is a police officer. He's been a police officer his whole life. Guess what he, Mike Boyle got put on? He got put on the terrorist watch list because there's an IRA terrorist named Mike Boyle. So every time Mike goes to the airport, he has to play the little dance. So you want to buy a gun. They call up some third-party bureaucrat far, far away. In an office, they run your name through, and they either say yes, no, or wait. Has that ever happened to any of you? Have you ever gone to purchase a firearm and been told, wait? Well, what do you what do you mean, wait? Wait means that the bureaucrat on the other end of the phone doesn't think you should be allowed to have it just yet. You can go ahead and come back later. You say, but I'm not a criminal. Why should I have to come back later? Because we said so. Go away now. And you have no recourse. Uh, for those of you uh, up in uh, the Northeast, I'm going to go ahead and ding on you for a second. Or in any People's Republic or what I call Occupied America, uh, how many of you up there in the sound of my voice think that the rest of the world, that the rest of America, that we have to get a permit to buy a pistol? You can put your hands down. Guess what? In free America, we don't have to seek out the permission of the government to purchase a handgun. Now, we do have to get tacit permission because it is a firearm, but there's no special permit. A lot of states in the United States have uh, a pistol permit where if you want to own a handgun, you have to get special permission from the government. In the state of New York, they've been boiling you, you frogs up there, they've been boiling you in a slow pot for a long, long time, and it's just been they turned up the heat to the point that you actually felt it here recently, but you've been boiling for a long time. In the state of New York, I have a good friend of mine who, uh, you know, I see him at least once a year at the SHOT Show, and we were talking about being a handgun owner in New York. And he said, oh, oh I, I, can own a, I can own handguns in New York. And he lives in New York City. I said, really, what, what can you own? Well, well, you're not allowed to have more than 10 rounds. I was like, okay, so what do you have? Well, I've got, I've got a SIG uh, 220. And so he, he reaches in his pocket, in his wallet, and he pulls out his New York handgun permit. He said, see, right here. And he flips it over, and he shows me that there are three guns listed on the back of it. They have the, the name of the gun, the description, and uh, the serial number. And he said, yeah, we can own guns, no problem. So 
What you can own is you can own a very specific type of gun. And I said, what if you don't have that card on you when, when you have the gun with you? Oh, well, you have to. Or what? Or you're a de facto criminal. Or they can take your guns away from you. Well, what if you sell it? Well, if you sell your gun, then you have to tell them immediately that you transferred that gun from yourself to another person and it's no longer in your possession. So you have to seek permission from the government is what you're saying. Well, no, you just have to tell them. Folks, that is not the way the United States of America was set up to work. We weren't set up so that we have to seek permission from the government to do anything. Uh, I know you have to get driver's licenses. Don't write me letters. I get that. But, folks, you're, you're, you're a crazy person. If you think that I had a, another guy, a friend that I worked with, and uh, he was stationed in, the, in, in Chicago, outside of Chicago, in Illinois, when he was in the Navy. And he moved to free America. And uh, he, he told me, he said, uh, well, I still have some guns at home in, uh, in Chicago, you know, in Illinois, and I need to bring them in to Mississippi. He said, where do I go to register them? I said, you don't. This is free America, brother. You don't have to seek permission from the commissar to register your guns. He said, well, how do I get them into the state? I said, you pack them up in a box, put them in your car, and you drive them down here, and you live in free America from now on. It's craziness. But if you're raised like that, if that's where you're at, you think that's reasonable. I've been up to Massachusetts. I love Smith & Wesson. I've gone to the Smith & Wesson Academy. And in the academy, they have certain guns that you that are approved by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and only those guns can be used out on the range. A lot of the guns that Smith & Wesson manufactures in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are illegal to own in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Riddle me that, Batman. How does that work? You're making guns in a state, and I, folks... It, I, 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 it's, it's maddening to me because I've been in the firearms industry for a long, long time. I have a lot of friends in the firearms industry, and I just can't fathom how a gun manufacturer can stay in a state that doesn't like them or that penalizes them or that makes the things that they manufacture illegal for the citizens to own. It's craziness. Why would you want to give millions upon millions of dollars in tax money to Massachusetts or Connecticut or New York, you're giving them all this tax revenue and they're turning around saying, we don't like you and we think that your industry is evil and should be out of business. Well, it doesn't work both ways. And all of my friends up in these, in these uh, occupied territories do what Magpul's doing. Magpul will be gone and out of Colorado. Uh, they put out a press release today. The president of Magpul said that that he's anticipating within 30 days they will have the first non-Colorado PMAGs, and they're getting re they're taking all their jobs and they're moving them out of Colorado. And all the Colorado people are like, oh, "It's not fair. You can't do that." You know, blah blah blah. What do you think they're supposed to do? <laughs> why should we stay here you already told us you don't like us we're going to take our tax revenue and our jobs somewhere else where they do like us and uh you know i i really wish that some of my good friends that are in occupied territory up in the northeast hey georgia wants you mississippi wants you i know texas does texas i know uh, i just talked to a friend of mine in texas and he said that they have uh very attractive uh, tax codes uh, for people who want to relocate businesses there. So do it. Uh, and it's not like it was 50 years ago. You say, oh, well, there's, you know, we can't move because we, we can't find the labor force or or we, we can't get the supplies or the machinery. Folks, it's 2013. You can build them anywhere. All right. We're talking about amendments today. Let's go ahead and talk about the First Amendment. The First Amendment. This is the one that liberals love to wrap their arms around and give it a big sloppy kiss. They love the First Amendment because it gives them the right to say any kind of whack job thing that they want to say. But if you or I try and exercise the First Amendment, we need to be silenced and censored and shut down. Now, if you're listening to my voice, I'm going to ask you a very, very simple question. 
If you post something on Facebook, yes, I know that Facebook is public and you don't have an expectation of privacy. But if you post a photograph or a phrase or a saying or words on Facebook, do you believe that that's protected under the First Amendment? I'm not talking about screaming fire in a crowded theater. I'm not talking about making threats against the president. I'm talking about just, you know, regular things. Do you think that that's protected by the First Amendment? You would think it is, but according to current precedent, it is not. A, uh, if you're paying attention, and if you're not, shame on you, start paying attention. A uh, father and uh, bought his son a Smith & Wesson 20 M&P 22 rifle. Now, it looks like an AR, but it's a 22, shoots 22 LR for his 11th birthday. And if you know about this, just hang with me, bear with me, because there's a lot of folks out there who don't. The kid uh, poses for a picture, big, bright smile, finger off the trigger, uh, poses for a picture. One of his rat neighbors, apparently, or somebody who friended him on Facebook, uh, called the Children's Services. So here's, you know, Mr. Citizen, law-abiding citizen. He's actually an NRA instructor, which in the eyes of a liberal is a strike against you. But uh, he, he's at home on a Friday night, and bam, 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 here comes the Gestapo. We demand entry. We need to see a child services is there because someone anonymously reported that there were children in the home that had access to firearms. And they brought four police officers with them as muscle to back themselves up. And they demanded entry. Now, this man got on his phone, put his phone on speaker, and got his attorney on there and was told him, this is what's going on. What should I do? And he told him, do they have a warrant to search your home? He said, no, they don't. He said, don't let them in. And he didn't. And they persisted. And they tried to badger and bully him into entering his home. They wanted to check and see if his guns were registered, so they said. Even in New Jersey, long guns don't have to be registered, and it's voluntary. Okay, I believe handguns in New Jersey have to be registered. But uh, which, again, is craziness, but they do. Now you say, oh, well, big deal, isolated incident. Really, is it? Is it an isolated incident? Why at an 830 on a Friday night do the Child Protective Services feel they need to bring stormtroopers with them to beat on your door, demand entry? I was a cop, like I said, for 17 years. I dealt with children's services. You know, I'm sure that somewhere in the United States of America, there are children's services people uh, that are dedicated, that are not bullies, that are not bureaucrats. I haven't come across one yet. And if you are one, send me a note because I'd like to meet you. Because most of the children's services people that I've run into were bullies and thugs. Be you know why? Because it's easy. America, it's easy to pick on citizens. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Why is it? What do you mean it's easy to pick on citizens? Think about it. You've got a family. You've got a career. You've got a reputation that you work on upholding. You have something to lose. And they know that. Career criminals have nothing to lose. They've been through the system. They know if they go to jail, it's no big deal because they're not going to stay there that long. Even if they get arrested tonight, they're probably going to be bailed out tomorrow. And if they get convicted, they're going to do 25% of their sentence, maybe. That's not that big of a deal to them. It's tough to deal with real criminals. It really is. But guess what? Mr. and Mrs. America, they're easy to roll over. They're easy to bully. Why are they easy to bully? Because they're worried about their reputations, about their careers and their family. And you have people in the government right now that seize upon that. Uh, so I ask you this. You say, well, that's just an isolated incident in New Jersey where some some panty waist do-gooder saw this guy's picture of his son and called Child Protective Services. Okay. What's going on in New York right now, folks? Oh, Governor Cuomo just instituted a $500 reward for ratting out your neighbor. Well, for for reports on an illegal gun. I I, I, I like how we're worried about inanimate objects being illegal. We're not actually worried about human beings that commit crimes. 
because they're difficult to deal with. It's tough to deal with actual humans that commit crimes. And, you know, in the United States today, it seems like we really don't want to deal with the humans that are committing the crimes. Why would why would we do that? So uh, Governor Cuomo just uh, set up a program where you can rat on your neighbor and get five hundred dollars. Yep. And you think that the that the issue, the incident in New Jersey was isolated? Ha! It's just been it's just been given uh, government authority. Rat out your neighbor. You think your neighbor has an illegal gun? He has illegal bullets, illegal clips, because, you know, liberals don't know magazines. I think my neighbor has an illegal clip. You need to go break down his door at midnight and search for an illegal clip. How long do you think it's going to be before the guy who hates his neighbor because his neighbor's dog pooped in his yard calls the 1-800 tip line to get the SWAT team out there? How long? It probably already happened. Ladies and gentlemen, it's disgusting and you need to do something about it. Now you're like, oh, Paul, man, I just want to, I just want to go out and shoot my guns and, and have a good time. And I just want to relax. I don't want to pay attention to politics. You say, I don't care about politics. I've got a lot of friends like that, uh, or acquaintances. They're not close friends, uh, because my friends actually do care. But, uh, the reason that we are in the predicament that we're in here in 2013 is because for decades upon decades upon decades, Good people, citizens with careers and jobs, taxpayers have said exactly what you're saying in your mind right now. I don't want to get involved in politics. I don't like politics. I, I'm not going to pay attention to it. Well, because too many good people have not paid attention for all these years, we're reaping what we have sown. We're getting a, you know, the rewards of that inattention. Those are coming back to us right now. And the tie, it's 2013, and right now as you hear the sound of my voice, know this. The time for being in the middle of the road is over. You have to choose sides. I know you don't want to because it's going to require effort. It's going to be painful. It's going to be something that you may not want to do. But we can't keep ignoring this problem. We can't keep abdicating our rights and our freedoms for the promise of a free phone. You can't do it, folks. And you say, oh, I don't got a free phone. Well, you know what? Did you vote last election? Well, I was mad because of my candidate didn't get, you know, didn't make get the nomination. All right. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we can't stop. We can't ignore it anymore. You have to pay attention. You have to care. And you should be outraged. If the things that I've spoken about so far on this program have not outraged you, well, I don't think anything will. Uh, you probably cannot be outraged and, uh, I'm glad that you listened, but you probably cannot be outraged. If you don't think that, uh, arbitrarily turning citizens into potential criminals is not a big deal. Uh, if putting together a program where people can rat out their neighbors, that's not a big deal. Uh, the child services Gestapo coming and beating on your door because there's a picture of your kid with a 22 rifle on your Facebook page, and that is their probable cause? That's not harassment and abuse of power? If you don't think that's an harassment and abuse of power, I, I don't I don't even think I can reach you. So, But you know what? There's probably an NPR program on right now that you could listen to. Now you say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, number one, A, number one, everybody within earshot of you or people that you spend time with, make sure they're educated. Make sure they actually know what is in the Bill of Rights. Remember I said, you know, people ask me about, do you like the Second Amendment? And I say, I kind of like them all. They're not, a, it's not a difficult read. Jared, how long does it take to read the Bill of Rights? I put him on the spot. He said, 15 minutes if you take your time. All right. The Constitution, even the entire United States Constitution can be read in a span of what, 30 minutes, an hour? an hour if you read slowly, it's not difficult. It was deliberately and purposely made to be simple so that everyone could understand it. And they say, oh, but politics are just so confusing. Do you know why they're confusing? They're confusing on purpose so that you won't pay attention or you'll get frustrated and you'll say, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it to the experts. Well, I don't think that uh, 
if you're with me, that you believe that the people in Washington today are necessarily the experts, and they're certainly not necessarily the experts in constitutional scholarship. Uh, they seem to be the experts in turning good guys into bad guys while letting bad guys run free. Ladies and gentlemen, I really do appreciate you spending some time again with me here on Student of the Gun Radio. I'm sorry if you think I brought you down this week, but we just can't let it go. I could not go to bed tonight having not discussed it. You need to know if you are a lawful citizen, if you consider yourself a law-abiding American citizen, you cannot continue to allow your rights to be trampled. Do not allow your elected civil servants, people who are supposed to be working for you. Last I checked, we didn't have a peasant class and a ruling class. They are not the ruling class, and we are not the peasant class. Quite frankly, it's the opposite. We're the ones that are supposed to be in charge. It's not supposed to be the citizenry that is afraid that the government is going to come beat on their door over a Facebook post. That's not the way the United States of America is supposed to work. Now, if you haven't checked out Crossbreed's uh, website yet, I suggest that you do so. they got lots of good stuff on there. The Crossbreed Super Tuck Holster. I'm going to go on record right now. It is the most comfortable in the waistband holster I've ever worn in my life. Jared, if I'm lying, I'm dying, right? He's nodding. Ladies and gentlemen, he is nodding. Uh, for the longest time, I could not wear an in the waistband holster. Just couldn't do it. I tried for years when I was a cop. I tried. And what I've, I, you got the hot spots. After an hour or two, you're constantly digging at your holster, adjusting it, moving it back, moving it forward. And, <laughs> if you're old enough to remember the uh, the 12 hour cross your heart bras or the 12 hour bra commercial where you can put it on the morning and wear it all day, and uh, when I was a kid, the the 20, 12 hour bra commercials. Well, the the Crossbreed Super Tuck holster is easily a 12 hour holster. It's a holster that you put on the morning, you adjust it, and you just wear it all day until you go to bed. And there's no hot spots. There's no rub areas. There's none of that constantly digging at it. As a matter of fact, it's so freaking comfortable that I, I find up doing that, like, frisk myself, like, is my gun on? Yeah, well, there it is. It is. Because it, it – and it's just – it's a simple yet genius design. And uh, um, my dear departed friend, uh, Mark Craighead, designed it, and he said it's one of those things that when you look at it, you don't get it. When you wear it, you get it. And not just for one day. Crossbreed, I, th I think they still have the two-week try-it guarantee because he said you can't just put this thing on and wear it for an hour. That's not that's not how it works. You know, it's like going to the range and shooting five rounds out of a pistol and saying, "Oh, I don't like this." Uh, you really need to try it out. And uh, if you're going to spend the money on a crossbreed, spend the money on the the uh, horse hide, right, Jared? Got to you. Got to get the horse hide. Spend the extra ten bucks, dude. If you're gonna wear a gun twelve hours a day every day for three hundred sixty five days, that ten dollars is nothing. Spend the end. I don't know if it's ten dollars now or fifteen or whatever. Spend the extra money on the horse hide because what's gonna happen is that holster's actually gonna conform to you. So when you take it off at night and you set it down, you set it uh, holster portion down, the leather is still gonna be in the shape of your body. And so when you put the holster on the next day, you really don't even have to think about how does this go on me because it conforms to your body. Whatever body shape you happen to have, it's going to conform to it. Now, my fo my friends at uh, at Keltec, <laughs> they want you to know that they are not making parts for NASA. <laughs> I had no idea that rumor was out there, but I was talking to my buddy uh, Chad at Keltec, and he said, please tell your fans that that we didn't stop building guns so we could build parts for NASA. Uh, apparently, because they're in Florida, they've been accused of slowing down their firearms production in order to make parts for NASA. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe they think because their guns look like space guns or laser guns or something that it makes sense. But, no, they are, they're not building parts for NASA. They're building guns as fast as they can build them for you guys. Uh, kel guns are very popular, and they're just building them as fast as they can. If, if, you, if you're on the kel waiting list, you're probably, you're probably not my friend right now. You're probably like, that's easy for you to say I've been on a list for a PMR-30 for two months or three months or whatever, and I still don't have it. <laughs> well, actually, it was two months back in October. It probably It's probably a year now. If you don't have an order in already, you're just kind of SOL. Maybe you can pick one up from a friend of yours in New York. Ooh.
That's right. You can't do that. <laughs> Colorado, oop, you can't do that. New Jersey, oop, you can't get one from them either. Well, if you come down here and visit us in free America, we've got them. So you might want to think about taking a visit to free America. It's nice to be here. All right, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, I want to thank you for joining me uh, for Student of the Gun Radio. We want to thank our good friends at Firearms Radio Network for bringing us on board and supporting us. We couldn't do it without them. And until next time, keep shooting straight and keep shooting safe.